After retiring, he had moved to Arizona with his wife and lived in relative seclusion on his own desert estate, far away from the hustle and bustle of the growing city of Scottsdale. When Frank told me that he had been involved in taking nearly 100 companies public during his career, I knew why I was having lunch with him. Not wanting to appear too excited or overly aggressive, I did my best to control myself. Frank is a very private individual and grants time to very few people. Lunch ended pleasantly without my discussing what I wanted to discuss. As I said, I did not want to appear too eager and naive. For the next two months, I called and asked for another meeting. Always the gentleman, Frank would politely say no or avoid setting a time to get together. Finally, he said yes and gave me directions to his home, way out in the desert. We set a date and I began rehearsing what I wanted to say. After a week of waiting, I found myself driving up to his home. The first thing that greeted me was a beware of dog sign. My heart raced as I drove up his long driveway, and then I saw a large black lump lying in the middle of the road. It was the dog I was supposed to be wary of, and it was a very big dog. I parked the car just in front of the dog because the dog would not move out of the way. About twenty feet separated my truck and the front door of the house, and this big dog was in between. I opened the door of my truck slowly until I realized the dog was sound asleep. I slowly stepped down from the cab of the truck, but as soon as my foot hit the gravel, the dog suddenly came to life. This big black dog stood to full height. It looked at me, and I looked at it. My heart raced as I prepared to jump back into the cab of the truck. Suddenly, the dog began wagging its stubby tail as well as its whole back end and walk forward to greet me. I spent five minutes petting and being licked to death by this large black guard dog. My wife, Kim, and I have a personality rule when it comes to business. Never do business with pets you don't trust. Over the years, we have discovered that people and their pets are very similar. One time we did a real estate transaction with a husband and wife who had many pets. He loved small dogs known as pugs, and she loved colorful, exotic birds. When Kim and I went to their house, their small, cute dogs and birds appeared friendly, but once you got close to them, they were vicious. As soon as we approached them, they would snap at us and start to bark or squawk loudly and aggressively. A week after the deal was closed, Kim and I found out that the owners were just like their pets, cute on the outside, but vicious on the inside. In the fine print of the contract, we had been bitten badly. Even our attorney at the time had missed the subtle bite. The investment came out all right, but since then, Kim and I have developed this new policy. If we are having any doubts about the people we are doing business with and they have pets, find a way to check out their pets. Humans are able to put forth a pleasant front and say things they really don't mean with a smile, but their pets don't lie. Over the years, we have found this simple guideline to be fairly accurate. We have found that a person's insides are reflected on his or her pet's outside. My meeting with Frank was therefore off to a good start. The meeting with Frank did not go so well at first. I asked Frank if I could apprentice with him and be an inside investor with him. I told him that I would work for free if he would teach me what he knew about the process of taking a company public. I explained to him that I was financially free and that I did not need money to work with him. Frank was skeptical for about an hour. He and I went back and forth, discussing the value of his time and questioning my ability to learn quickly and my willingness to stick with the process. He was afraid that I would quit once I found out how hard it was, since My background was weak when it came to finance and the capital markets, such as Wall Street. He also said, I've never had anyone offer to work for free just so they could learn from me. The only times people have ever asked me for anything is when they wanted to borrow money or they wanted a job. I reassured him that all I wanted was the opportunity to work with him and to learn. 
I told him about my rich dad guiding me for years and my working for free much of the time. Finally, he asked, How badly do you want to learn this business? I looked him squarely in the eye and said, I want to learn it very badly. Good, he said. I am currently looking at a bankrupt gold mine located in the Andes Mountains of Peru. If you really want to learn from me, then fly to Lima this Thursday, inspect the mine with my team, meet with the bank, find out what it wants for it, return, and give me a report on your findings. And by the way, this entire trip is at your own expense. I sat there with a stunned look on my face. Fly to Peru this Thursday? I restated. Frank smiled. Still want to join my team and learn the business of taking a company public? My stomach turned into a knot, and I broke out in a mild, cold sweat. I knew my sincerity was being tested. This was a Tuesday, and I had appointments already scheduled for Thursday. Frank sat patiently as I thought over my options. Finally, he asked quietly with a very pleasant tone and smile, Well, still want to learn my business? I knew I was at a defining moment. I knew it was time to put up or shut up. I was now testing myself. My choice had nothing to do with Frank. It had everything to do with the next evolution of my personal development. At times like this, I recall the wisdom of the great philosopher Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless dreams and splendid plans. That the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. It is the phrase, then providence moves too, that keeps me taking a step forward when the rest of me wants to step backwards. Webster defines providence as divine guidance or care, God conceived as the power sustaining and guiding human destiny. Whenever I come to the edge of my world or when I am about to take a step into the unknown, all I have at that moment is my trust in a larger power. It is at such moments when I know I must step over the edge that I take a deep breath and take the step. It can be called a leap of faith. I call it a test of my trust in a power much bigger than myself. In my opinion, it is those first steps that have made all the difference in my life. The initial results have not always been as I would have liked them to be, but my life has always changed for the better in the long run. I have a deep respect for Goethe's couplet, Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. As Goethe's words faded, I looked up and said, I'll be in Peru this Thursday. Frank smiled a wide, quiet smile. Here is a list of people you are to meet and where to meet them. Call me when you get back. This is not a recommendation. This is definitely not the path I would recommend for anyone wanting to learn to take a company public. There are smarter and easier paths. Yet this was the path that was laid out for me. Therefore, I will faithfully describe to you the process by which I came to achieve my goal. In my opinion, everyone must be true to his or her own mental and emotional strengths and weaknesses. I am simply relating the process I went through once I knew the next direction in my life. It was not mentally hard, but it was emotionally challenging, as most significant changes in life tend to be. Rich Dad often said, an individual's reality is the boundary between self-confidence and faith. He would then say, the boundaries of a person's reality often do not change until that person forsakes what he or she feels confident in and then goes blindly with faith. So many people do not become rich because they are limited by their self-confidence rather than the limitlessness of faith. 
On that Thursday in the summer of 1996, I was on my way to the Andes Mountains to inspect a gold mine that was once mined by the Incas and then the Spaniards. I was taking a bold step of faith into a world I knew nothing about. Yet because of that step, a whole new world of investing opened up to me. My life has not been the same since I decided to take that step. My reality regarding what is possible financially has not been the same. My reality on how rich a person can become has expanded. The more I continue working with Frank and his team, the further those limits to wealth expand. Today, I continue to expand my limits, and I can hear my rich dad say, a person is limited only to his or her reality of what is possible financially. Nothing changes until a person's reality changes, and a person's financial reality will not change until he or she is willing to go beyond the fears and doubts of his or her own self-imposed limits. Frank kept his word. Upon returning from the trip, I reported back to Frank. The mine was a great mine with strong and proven veins of gold, but it had financial problems as well as many operational challenges. I recommended against acquiring it because the mine had severe social problems and had severe environmental problems that would have cost millions to clean up. In order to make the mine operate efficiently, any new owners would have to downsize the workforce by at least 40%. It would destroy the town's economy. I said to Frank, For centuries these people have lived there at 16,000 feet above sea level. Generations of their families are buried there. I do not think it is wise for us to be the ones to force them to leave the home of their ancestors to seek work in the cities at the base of the mountain. I think we would have more problems than we want to deal with. Frank agreed with my findings and, more importantly, agreed to teach me. We were soon looking at mines and oil fields in other parts of the world, and a new chapter in my educational process began. From the summer of 1996 to the fall of 1997, I worked as an apprentice to Frank. He was busy working on developing his company, Easy Energy Corporation, not the real name, which was just about to go public on the Alberta Stock Exchange in Canada when I joined him. Since I was late joining his team, I was not able to acquire any of the pre-IPO shares at the insider's price. It would not have been appropriate for me to invest with the founders since I was still new and untested. Yet I was still able to acquire a sizable block of stock at the IPO price of 50 cents, Canadian, a share. After striking oil in Colombia and finding what appeared to be a large oil and gas field in Portugal, Easy Energy stock was trading at around $2 to $2.35, Canadian, a share. If, and that is a qualified if, the field in Portugal proves to be as big as we hope it is, the price per share of easy energy could climb to $25 Canadian. That is the upside. There is also a downside with these micro-cap stocks. The shares could also go down to zero per share and become worthless. A lot of things are possible when companies are at this stage of development. Although Easy Energy is a very small company, the increase in value for what Frank calls the front money investors could be significant. These investors could potentially make a lot of money. These front money investors, pre-IPO accredited investors, invested thousands of dollars based on Frank's reputation, the strength of the board of directors, and the business expertise of the oil exploration team. But there are no guarantees. In other words, in the beginning, this investment was all P, price, and no E, earnings. It was initially offered only to Frank's friends and his inner circle of investors. At this stage of the investment cycle, investors invest in the people on the team. The people, much more than the product, be it oil, gold, an internet product, or widgets, are far more important than any other part of the equation. The golden rule that money follows management is extremely important at this stage of a company's development. 
rather than go into the hype, hopes, and dreams of this company, I think it best to quote you just the facts of this publicly traded company. The founders of the company put up their time and expertise in exchange for shares in the company. In other words, most of the founders work for free, investing their time and expertise in return for blocks of shares of stock. The value of their stock when issued is very small, so they have very little, if any, earned income. They work without pay, intending to increase the value of their stock, which will generate portfolio income rather than earned income. A few of the founders are paid a small salary for their services. They work for the bigger payoff, which comes if they do a good job of growing the company and making it more valuable. Since most of the directors are not drawing a salary, it is in their best interest to increase and keep increasing the company's value. Their personal interest is the same as the shareholder's interest, which is an ever-increasing price per share. The same is true for many of the company's officers. They may draw a small salary, but are really more interested in the price per share going up. The founders are very, very important to the success of a startup because their reputation and expertise give credibility, confidence, momentum, and legitimacy to a project that often exists only on paper. Once the company is public and successful, some of the founders may resign, taking their stock with them. A new management team replaces them, and the founders move on to another startup, repeating the process. History of Easy Energy The following is a sequence of events that occurred after the company was founded. 1. Front money investors put up $25,000 U.S. for 100,000 shares, or $0.25 cents per share. At this stage, the company had a tentative plan but owned no exploration leases. There were no assets. Front money investors invested in management. 2. The shares currently trade in range between $2 and $2.35 Canadian per share. 3. Therefore, the worth of the front money investors' block of 100,000 shares rose to $200,000 to $235,000 Canadian, $160,000 to $170,000 U.S. The director's job now is to keep increasing the value of the company and its share price by bringing to market the oil it has found, drilling more wells, and finding more oil reserves. On paper, the front money investors have made about $140,000 on their $25,000 investment. They have been in the deal for five years, so their annual rate of return would be 45% if they could sell their shares. 4. The problem for the investors is that the company is small and the shares are very thinly traded. An investor with 100,000 shares would be hard-pressed to sell 100,000 shares all at once without seriously depressing the price of the stock. So the valuation of the entire block of stock is, in many ways, a paper valuation at this time. If things go as planned, the company will grow and more people will begin to follow the company and the stock. Buying and selling larger blocks of these shares should then become easier. Due to the good news of the discoveries, most large block investors are holding on to their shares rather than selling. Why a Canadian exchange? When I first began working with Frank, I asked him why he used the Canadian exchanges rather than the more well-known NASDAQ or Wall Street. In America, the Canadian exchanges are often treated as the Rodney Dangerfields of the North American securities industry. Yet Frank uses the Canadian exchanges because 1. The Canadian exchanges are the world leaders for financing small natural resource companies. Frank uses them because he primarily develops these types of companies. Frank is like Warren Buffett, who tends to stay with businesses he understands. I understand oil and gas, silver and gold, Frank says. I understand natural resources and precious metals. 
if Frank were to develop a technology company, he would probably list it on an American exchange. 2. NASDAQ and Wall Street have gotten too big for a small company to gain any attention there. Frank said, When I started in this business in the 1950s, a small company could gain some attention from the brokers on the major exchanges. Today, Internet companies, many without any earnings, are commanding more money than many larger well-known industrial age companies. Hence, most larger brokerage houses are not very interested in small companies that need to raise only a few million dollars. Brokerage houses in America are interested primarily in offerings of $100 million or more. 3. The Canadian exchanges let the small entrepreneurs stay in the business. I think Frank uses Canadian exchanges mainly because he is retired. He often says, I don't need the money, so I don't need to build a big company to make a big score. I just enjoy the game, and it keeps me active. Where else can my friends get into an IPO play for only $25,000 for 100,000 shares of stock? I do this because it's still fun, I love the challenges, and the money can be rewarding. I love starting companies, taking them public, and watching them grow. I also love having my friends and their families become rich. Frank offers a word of caution. Just because the Canadian exchanges are small does not mean that anyone can play their game. Some of the Canadian exchanges have gained a shaky reputation due to past transactions. To work with these exchanges, a person should be very familiar with the ins and outs of taking a company public. 4. The good news is that the Canadian system of stock exchanges appears to be tightening up on regulations, which are being enforced more closely. In a few years, I think the Canadian exchanges will grow as more and more small companies from all over the world look to the smaller exchanges to raise the capital they need. Beware of the stock promoter. In the few years I have been actively involved in this business, I have come across three individuals who had the right credentials as well as the right letters after their name, told a great story, raised tens of millions of dollars, and had absolutely no idea how to start a business and build one from scratch. For several years, such people fly around in first class or on private jets, stay at the best hotels, put on lavish dinner parties, drink the best wines, and live high on the hog on their investors' money. The company soon dies because there is no actual development. The cash flow has all been going out. These people then go on to start another company and do it all over again. How do you spot a sincere entrepreneur from a big-spending dreamer? That I do not know. A couple of people sure had me fooled until their companies folded. The best advice I can give is to ask for a past track record, check references, and let your sixth sense or intuition be your guide. 5. If a small company grows and prospers, it can later move from a small exchange to a bigger exchange such as NASDAQ or NYSE. Companies that make the move from a Canadian exchange to an American exchange average a substantial increase in the valuation of the company, sometimes over 200%. Most of today's big-name companies started out as small, unknown companies. In 1989, Microsoft was a small company whose stock sold for $6 a share. In 1991, Cisco stock was just $3 a share. Both of these stocks have since split a number of times. These companies used their investors' money wisely and grew into major powerhouses in the world economy. A Difficult Process The entry requirements of the major stock markets in the United States have made the IPO a difficult process for most businesses. As described in the Ernst & Young Guide to Taking Your Company Public, the New York Stock Exchange requires a company to have net tangible assets of $18 million and pre-tax income of $2,500,000.
the American Stock Exchange requires a stockholder's equity of $4 million and a market value of the IPO to be a minimum of $3 million. And the NASDAQ National Market requires net tangible assets of at least $4 million and a market value of the IPO to be a minimum of $3 million. Many small to medium companies that cannot meet these qualifications look for reverse merger opportunities, which allow them to merge with an existing public company. Through that process, the company can become a publicly traded company by taking control of the newly combined public company. Companies may also look to other foreign exchanges, like the Canadian exchange, where the entry requirements are not as severe. Who buys Canadian? During one of my talks on investing in Australia some time ago, a member of the audience questioned my sanity at investing in precious metals and oil. He asked, If everyone else is in high-tech and Internet stocks, why are you working on the dogs of the economy? I explained that it is always less expensive to be a contrarian investor, which is an investor who seeks out of favor or out-of-cycle stocks. A few years ago, I said, when everyone was into gold, silver, and oil, the prices of the exploration leases that make up these startups were very high. It was very difficult to find a deal at a good price. Now that the prices of oil, gold, and silver are down, finding good properties is easy, and people are more willing to negotiate because these commodities are out of favor. The price of oil is now rising, making the shares in our oil company much more valuable. Also during this period, Warren Buffett announced that he was taking a sizable position in silver. In February 1998, the billionaire investor disclosed that he had acquired 130 million ounces of silver and stored it in a warehouse in London. On September 30, 1999, Canadian Business ran an article indicating that the world's richest man, Bill Gates, had made a buy in silver, acquiring a 10.3% stake for $12 million, U.S., of a Canadian silver company listed on the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Gates had been quietly acquiring shares in the company since February 1999. When this announcement went out to our investors, the news was welcome relief for their years of trust and confidence. You don't always hit home runs. Not all startup companies do as well as Easy Energy. Some never get off the ground even after going public, and the investors lose most, if not all, of their front money. Investors therefore need to be accredited and are warned about the all-or-nothing type of investments we bring to market. As one of Frank's partners, I speak to potential investors about becoming front money investors in new companies. I explain the risks to potential investors before I discuss the business, the people involved, or the rewards. I often start my presentation by saying, The investment I am about to talk about is a very high-risk speculative investment offered primarily to investors who meet the requirements of an accredited investor. If a person does not know the requirements for being an accredited investor, I explain the guidelines as laid out by the SEC. I also stress the possibility that they can lose all of their invested money, repeating that statement several times. If they are still interested, I go on to explain that any money placed with us should never be more than 10% of their total investment capital. Then, and only then, if they are still interested, do I go on to explain the investment, the risks, the team, and the possible rewards? At the end of my presentation, I ask for questions. After all the questions have been answered, I again reiterate the risks. I end by saying, if your money is lost, all I can offer you is the first opportunity to invest in our next business. By this time, most people are fully aware of the risks. I would say that 90% decide not to invest with us. We give the 10% who are still interested more information as well as more time to think things over and to back out if they desire. 
Many of today's high-flying internet IPOs will come crashing down in the next few years, and investors will lose millions, if not billions, of dollars. Although the internet does provide a tremendous new frontier, the forces of economics allow only a few of the pioneering companies to be winners. So, regardless of whether the company going public is a gold mining company, a plumbing supply company, or an internet company. The forces of the public market still have much of the control. A great education. Deciding to fly to Peru turned out to be a great decision for me. I have learned as much from being Frank's student and partner as I did from my rich dad. After I put in about a year and a half as an apprentice to Frank and his team, he offered me a partnership in his private venture capital company. Since 1996, I have gained the experience of a lifetime watching Easy Energy Company go public and develop into a viable company that someday may become a major oil company. I have not only become a wiser business person because of my association, but I have also learned a great deal about how stock markets work. One of my policies is to invest five years in the learning process. My gains so far may be all paper gains. Yet the business and investment education has been priceless. Maybe someday in the future, I will build a company to take public on an American exchange. Future IPOs. Frank and his private venture capital team developed three other companies to bring to the public market: a precious metals company that secures leases in China, an oil company that secures oil and gas leases in Argentina, and a silver company. That acquires leases in Argentina. The company that took the longest to develop was the Chinese Precious Metals Company. We were doing fine with our negotiations with the Chinese government when suddenly, in 1999, a U.S. warplane bombed the Chinese embassy in Kosovo. Whatever the reason for the bombing, the incident set our relations back two years. Yet we continued to make steady but slow progress. When people ask why we take such great risks working in China, we reply, "It will soon be the largest economy in the world. Although the risks are huge, the potential payoff could be staggering." Investing in China today is like the English investing in America in the 1800s. We are investing in contacts and goodwill. We are well aware of the political differences and the human rights issues. As a company. We do our best to develop strong relationships and open communications with our contacts in China. The educational experience has been priceless for me. It is like being a part of history. Sometimes it almost feels like being on the same boat with Columbus as he set sail for the New World. It usually takes three to five years to bring a company to the public market. When that happened, I achieved my goal of becoming an ultimate investor. It was my first public company, but Frank's number ninety something. Given the risk involved, every one of these projects could have failed and never gone public. If that had happened, the pieces would have been picked up and new projects would have been started. Our investors know the risks involved, and also know that their investment plan is to put a little money in several of these smaller ventures. They also know that they will be called and asked to invest in any new startup we have. All it takes is one project to hit a home run. In investments such as these, it is definitely not wise to put all your eggs in one basket. It is because of such risks that the SEC has the minimum requirements for investors in such speculative investments. The next chapter briefly outlines the basic steps of starting with an idea, building a company, and perhaps eventually taking that company public. Although it has not been an easy process for me, it has been a very exciting one. A rite of passage. Taking a company public is a rite of passage for any entrepreneur. It would be like a college sports star being selected to play for a professional team. According to Fortune magazine, if you are acquired, a company validates you. If you go public, the market, the world, 
validates you. That is why Rich Dad called a person who can build a company from scratch and take it public an ultimate investor. That title eluded him. Although he invested in several businesses that ultimately did go public, none of the companies he actually started ever did go public. His son Mike took over his business and continued to grow it, but he has never built a company to take public. So, becoming an ultimate investor means that I have completed Rich Dad's training process. Chapter 40 Are You the Next Billionaire? A Forbes magazine cover stated, The Billionaire Next Door. That issue had an article entitled A Century of Wealth and a subtitle that read, Where Does Great Wealth Come From? Years ago, oil and steel were the foundations of many American fortunes. Today, it's more a matter of how many eyeballs you command. The article said, If you want to talk about the super-rich, you have to set your sights higher to billionaires who are being minted faster than ever, using ever more ephemeral products to make their money. It took Rockefeller 25 years of finding, drilling, and distributing oil to make his first billion. Gary Winnick joined the Billionaires Club just 18 months after putting his money into Global Crossing, a company that developed a global fiber-optic telecommunications network. So, how long does it take to become super-rich these days? The answer is not long. That reality becomes even more apparent for someone like me, a member of the baby boom generation, when I look at the ages of the new billionaires. For example, billionaire Jerry Yang was born in 1968, a year before I finished college, and David Philo, his partner, was born in 1966, a year after I entered college. Together, they founded Yahoo and are now worth more than $3 billion each. At the same time that these young people are super rich, I meet individuals who are wondering if they will have enough money in their retirement plans when they retire in 10 years. Talk about a gap between the haves and future have-nots. I'm taking my company public. In 1999, all I heard and read about were IPOs. There was definitely a mania. As someone who is often asked to invest in other people's businesses, I often hear sales pitches like this. Invest in my company, and in two years, we'll be going public. Some time ago, a budding future billionaire CEO called me and asked for an opportunity to show me his business plan and offered me the opportunity to invest in his future Internet company. After the presentation, he nodded slowly with a sly cockiness as he said, And of course you know what will happen to the price of your shares after the IPO. I felt like I was talking to a new car salesman who had just informed me that the car I wanted was the last one of its kind and he was doing me a special favor by letting me have it for the retail price. The IPO mania, also called the New Issues mania, was back on a little while ago when Martha Stewart took her company public and became a billionaire. She became a billionaire because her company teaches civilized and common-sense social graces to the masses, people who feel the need to be more civilized and more gracious. I think that service is valuable, but I wonder about the billion dollars of value. Yet, if you follow the Forbes 400 definition, wealth is dictated by how many eyeballs you command, Martha Stewart qualifies to be a billionaire. Her company definitely commands many eyeballs. My concern about new tech stock IPOs and Internet IPOs is that the 90-10 rule of money is still in control. Too many of these new startups are started by individuals with very little business experience. I predict that when we look back upon this time in history, we will find that 90% of the new IPOs will have failed and only 10% have survived. Statistics for small business show that in five years, nine out of ten small businesses have failed. If this statistic holds true for new IPOs, 
that could put us into the next recession and possible depression. Why? Because millions of average investors will be affected. Not only will millions lose their investment money, the ripple effect will spread to their not being able to afford new homes, cars, boats, and planes. This will take down the rest of the economy. There was a joke going around Wall Street after the 1987 crash that went like this. What is the difference between a seagull and a stockbroker? Answer. The seagull can still leave a deposit on a BMW. Flavor of the Month I first began working on an IPO back in 1978 in Hawaii. Rich Dad wanted me to learn the process of building a company to sell to the public while I was building my nylon and Velcro wallet company. He said, I've never taken a company public, but I have invested in several businesses that have gone public. I'd like you to learn the process from the gentleman I invest with. The person he introduced me to was Mark a man similar to my partner, Frank. The difference was that Mark was a venture capitalist, VC. I am a Vietnam veteran, so the letters had a different initial meaning to me. Small businesses came to Mark when they needed venture capital or money to expand their businesses. Since I needed lots of money to expand, Rich Dad encouraged me to meet with him and learn from his point of view. It was not a pleasant meeting. Mark was far tougher than my rich dad. He looked at my business plan and my actual financial statements and listened for about 23 seconds to my glorious plans for the future. Then he began to tear me apart. He told me why I was an idiot, a fool, and completely out of my league. He told me that I should never have quit my daytime job and that I was lucky my rich dad was his client. Otherwise, he would never have wasted any time on someone so incompetent. He then told me how much he thought my business was worth, how much money he could raise for it, his terms and conditions for the money, and that he would become my new partner with a controlling interest in the company. As I said, the term VC had a very familiar ring to it. In the business of IPOs, investment bankers and VCs, there is a sheet of paper known as the term sheet. It is similar to the sheet of paper that real estate agents call the listing agreement. Simply put, a term sheet states the terms and conditions of the sale of your business, just as a listing agreement states the terms and conditions for the sale of your house. Just as in listing agreements with real estate, a term sheet is different for different people. In real estate, if you're selling just one little house in a bad neighborhood and you want a high price, the terms on the listing agreement will be tough and inflexible. However, if you are a real estate developer with thousands of homes to sell and the houses are nice, easy to sell, and priced low, the real estate agent is more likely to soften his or her terms in order to get your business. The same is true in the world of the VC. The more successful you are, the better terms you get, and vice versa. After looking at Mark's term sheet, I felt his terms were too severe. I definitely did not want to give him 52% of my company to end up working for him in the company I started. Those were his terms. I am not blaming Mark, and in retrospect, maybe I should have taken those terms. Given what I know today and how little I knew back then, if I had been in Mark's position, I would have offered the same terms. I think the only reason he offered me anything was out of respect for my rich dad. I was a new business person, and I was successfully incompetent. I say successfully incompetent because I had a growing company, but I was not able to manage its growth. Although Mark was tough, I liked him, and he seemed to like me. We agreed to meet regularly, and he agreed to give me free advice as I grew. His advice might have been free, but it was always tough. He eventually began to trust me more as my knowledge and understanding of business grew. I even worked with him briefly on an oil company he was bringing to the public market. Working with him on that oil company in 1978 
I got my first taste of the excitement that comes from working on an IPO. During one of my lunches with him, he said something about the IPO business that I never forgot. He said, The new issues and IPO market are just like any other business. The market is always looking for the flavor of the month. Mark was saying that, at certain times, the stock market favors certain businesses more than others. He went on saying, If you want to become very rich, part of your strategy as a business owner is to build the company the market wants before the market wants it. Mark went on to explain that history makes famous the pioneer who has the business that is the flavor of the month. He said that inventions such as television created new millionaires just as oil and cars made billionaires at the start of the 20th century. Mark's concept of the progression of wealth is in line with that seen in this abbreviated list from Forbes magazine. 1900, Andrew Carnegie made his fortunes in steel, $475 million. 1910, John D. Rockefeller became a billionaire in oil, $1.4 billion. 1920, Henry Ford became a billionaire in the auto industry, $1 billion. 1930, John Durant became a millionaire condensing soup into a can, Campbell's Soup, $115 million. 1940, Howard Hughes became a billionaire with military aircraft contracts, tools, and movies, $1.5 billion. 1950, Arthur Davis became a millionaire in aluminum, $400 million. 1960, H. Ross Perot founded EDS, 1962, $3.8 billion. 1970, Sam Walton took retailing giant Walmart public, $22 billion. 1980. Ron Perlman made his fortune as a Wall Street dealmaker, $3.8 billion. 1990. Jerry Yang co-founded Yahoo, $3.7 billion. Obsolete at 35. I did not work with Mark after 1978. As he predicted, my business success had begun to sour and I had massive internal problems in my company. I therefore had to put all my attention into my business rather than spend time trying to take someone else's business public. However, I never forgot his lesson on businesses as the flavor of the month. As I plod along continuing to gain my fundamental business experience, I often wonder what the next business flavor of the month will be. In 1985, I stopped by the Marine base at Camp Pendleton, California, where I had been stationed in 1971, just before going to Vietnam. My friend and fellow pilot was now the commanding officer of the squadron on the base. Kim and I were shown around the squadron where Jim and I had been new pilots 14 years earlier. Walking onto the flight line, Jim showed Kim an aircraft that looked like the ones he and I flew in Vietnam. Opening up the cockpit, he told me, You and I are now obsolete. We are not able to fly these aircraft. He said that because the instruments and controls were now fully electronic and video-oriented. Jim continued, saying, These new pilots grew up in video arcades. You and I grew up on pinball machines and pool tables. Our brains are not the same as theirs. That is why they fly and I sit behind a desk. I am obsolete as a pilot. I remember that day clearly because I too felt obsolete then. I felt old and out of date at age 37. I remember thinking that my own dad was obsolete by age 52, and here I was obsolete by age 37. On that day, I fully realized how fast things were changing. I also realized that if I did not change myself as rapidly, I would be left further and further behind. I worked with Frank, continuing my education in the IPO and VC business. 
I make paper money because I acquire paper assets. However, the most important thing I gained was experience in capital markets. Even though I worked on oil, gas, and precious metal companies, my mind continues to race ahead and wonder what the next frontier in business will be. I wonder what the next flavor of the month will be and if I will be part of that next explosion of wealth. Who knows? Colonel Sanders was 66 when he started KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. My goal is still to become a billionaire in my lifetime. Maybe I'll get there and maybe I won't, but I'm working every day towards that goal. Becoming a billionaire is quite possible today if you have the right plan. So I'm not giving up, and I have no plans to become poor or obsolete. As Rich Dad said, it's the first million that was the hardest. If that is the case, then the first billion could be the second hardest task. Are you the next billionaire? For those of you who may have similar ambitions and aspirations, I offer the following guidelines on taking your company public. The information comes generously from my partner Frank, a person who has taken almost a hundred companies public. Although there is a tremendous amount to learn, these guidelines will help you get started. Why take a company public? Frank lists six primary reasons to do so. 1. You need more money. This is one of the main reasons you take a company public. You might have an established, profitable company and need capital to grow. You have already been to your banker and have raised some funds through private placements and your VC, but now you need really big money from an investment banker. 2. Your company is new and you need massive amounts of money to gain market share. The market gives you the money, although your company is unprofitable today, because the market is investing in your future earnings. 3. Many times, a company will use its own company stock to acquire other companies. It is what Rich Dad called printing your own money. In the corporate world, it is called mergers and acquisitions. 4. You want to sell your company without giving up control. In a private company, the owner all too often gives up control or gains a new partner who wants to tell him how to run the business when raising capital. By getting the money from the public market, the owner gains cash, yet maintains control of the business. Most shareholders have very little power to influence the operations of the company they are invested in. 5. You want to raise money for estate reasons to provide for the heirs. Ford Motor Company went public because the family had many heirs, but no liquidity. By selling a part of the company to the public, it raised the cash the family needed for the heirs. It is interesting how often a private company will use this strategy. 6. You want to get rich and have cash to invest elsewhere. Building a business is much like building an apartment house and selling it. When you are building a business for sale through a public offering, however, only a part of the asset is broken off. It is broken into millions of pieces and sold to millions of people. The builder may therefore still own most of the asset, may still maintain control, and may generate a lot of cash by selling it to millions of buyers instead of just one buyer. As they say, good things come in small packages. There are restrictions that apply to the major shareholders and officers in a company issuing an IPO. While their holdings in the company may increase dramatically in value as a result of the IPO, they are severely regulated when selling any of their shares. Their stock is usually called restricted, which means they have agreed not to sell it for a predetermined amount of time. A shareholder wanting to cash out might be better served selling the company or merging into another company with free trading shares as opposed to using an IPO. Additional points to consider. 
Frank offers these additional considerations to keep in mind before taking a company public. Who on the team has run a business? There is a big difference between running a business and dreaming of a new product or a new business. Has the person handled payroll, employees, tax issues, legal issues, contracts, negotiations, product development, cash flow management, raising capital, and so on? You may notice that much of what Frank thinks is important is found in the BI triangle. Therefore, the core of the question is, are you, or someone on the team, successful at managing the entire BI triangle? How much of the company do you want to sell? This is where term sheets come in. In my years of working with Frank, I noticed that he always knows his goal for a company before he starts the company. He knows before he starts that his goal is to sell the company on the public market. He may not know how he is going to achieve his goal, but the goal is set. I mention this because so many business owners start a business without a concrete goal in mind for the end of the business. Many business owners start a business because they think the business is a good idea, but they have no plan on how to get out of the business. Fundamental to any good investor is an exit strategy. The same is true for an entrepreneur who is considering building a business. Before you build it, have a solid plan on how you're going to get out of it. Before you build a business, you might want to consider some of these issues. 1. Are you going to sell it, keep it, or pass it on to heirs? 2. If you are going to sell it, are you going to sell it privately or publicly? A. Selling a company privately can be as difficult as selling it publicly. B. Finding a qualified buyer can be difficult. C. Financing for the business may be difficult to come by. D. You may get it back if the new owner cannot pay you or mismanages it. Does the prospective public company have a well-written and well-thought-out business plan? This plan should include descriptions of 1. The team and team's experience 2. Financial statements The standard is three years of audited financials 3. Cash flow projections I recommend three years of very conservative cash flow projections. Frank states that investment bankers dislike CEOs and entrepreneurs who puff up their projections for future earnings. Bill Gates often understates Microsoft's earning projections, which is an excellent strategy for keeping the price of the stock strong. When CEOs exaggerate and earnings expectations are not met, the price of their stock often falls and investors lose confidence in the company. Who is the market, how big is the market, and how much growth is possible for the company's products in the market? While there is a market for your products, there is another market for the shares in your business. At different times, certain types of companies are more attractive to stock buyers than other companies. When a person has a public company, it is often said that it is like having two companies instead of one. One company is for your regular customers, and one is for your investors. Who is on your board of directors or advisory board? The market runs on confidence. If the company has a strong and respected board of directors or advisors, the market has more confidence in the future success of the business. Frank advises, if someone comes to you and says, I'm going to take my company public, ask that person, who on your team has taken a company public and how many companies has he or she taken public? If that person cannot answer that question, ask him or her to come back with the answer. Most never come back. Does the company own something proprietary? A business should own or control something that another company does not. It could be a patent on a new product or drug, a lease of ground in an oil field, or a trademark such as Starbucks or McDonald's. Even people who are owners and respected experts in their field can be considered assets. Examples of people being assets are Martha Stewart, 
Steve Jobs when he started his Apple computer company, and Steven Spielberg when he formed his production company. People invested in these people because of their past success and future potential. Does the company have a great story to tell? I am sure Christopher Columbus must have told a great story to his underwriters, the king and queen of Spain, before they raised the capital for him to sail off to the ends of the earth. A great story must interest, excite, and cause people to look into the future and dream a little. There should also be integrity behind the story, because our jails are filled with great storytellers who have no integrity. Do those involved with the company have passion? This is the most important thing that Frank looks for. He says that the first and last thing he looks for in any business is the passion of the owner, the leaders, and the team. Frank says, Without passion, the best business, the best plan, and the best people will not become successful. Here is an excerpt from Fortune Magazine's article on the 40 richest people under 40. MBAs don't fit into the Silicon Valley scene. MBAs are traditionally risk-averse. The reason most people go to business school is to ensure getting a six-figure job after graduation. Valley veterans look at B-school people and don't see the fire in the belly they themselves had when they were romantic renegades. MBAs look at Silicon Valley and see something far different from what they were taught in business school. Michael Levine joined eBay after graduating from Berkeley's Haas School. The former investment banker does not speak with the same passion displayed by hardcore entrepreneurs. He also works shorter hours than most, 60 per week instead of the customary 80. I'd love it if in 10 to 15 years I had $10 million to $15 million well invested, he told me. But I'd like to have a life. I don't know. Maybe I'm not there yet. Rich Dad would say that he was definitely not there yet. Rich Dad often cautioned me to be aware of the difference between successful corporate people and successful entrepreneurs. He would say, There is a difference between a person who climbs the corporate ladder and someone who is building his own corporate ladder. The difference is in the view when you look up at the ladder. One sees the big blue sky and the other sees, well, you know that saying, if you're not the lead dog, the view is always the same. How do you raise money? Frank discusses four sources of money. One, friends and family. These people love you and will often give you money blindly. He does not recommend this method of raising money. Both Frank and my rich dad have often said, don't give your children money. It keeps them weak and needy. Teach them how to raise money instead. Rich Dad took the issue of money one step further. As you may recall, he did not pay his son and me a salary for working for him. He said, Paying people to do work is training them to think like employees. Instead, he trained us to look for business opportunities and to create a business out of that opportunity. You may recall the comic book story in the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book where I discovered that older comic books were being taken off the shelf and destroyed by the store. I saw an opportunity to start a business by saving those comic books and creating a library where kids could rent the comics to read for a small fee and then return them. I continue to do the same thing today. I look around for opportunities to build a business while others look for high-paying jobs. Rich Dad did not make being an employee wrong. He loved his employees. He was just training his son and me to think differently and to be aware of the differences between a business owner and other positions. He wanted us to have more choices as we grew older rather than fewer. We created the Cash Flow for Kids board game for parents who want to give their kids more financial choices and keep them from being trapped in debt as soon as they leave home. It was created for parents who may suspect that their children could be the next Bill Gates of Microsoft or the next Anita Roddick of the body shop. 
the game provides an early financial education on cash flow management that every entrepreneur needs. Most small businesses fail because of poor cash flow management. Cash flow for kids will teach your children the skill of cash flow management before they leave home. 2. Angels Angels are rich individuals who have a passion to help new entrepreneurs. Most major cities have angel groups that support budding new entrepreneurs financially as well as provide advice on how to become rich, young entrepreneurs. Angels realize that it's important for a city to have growing young businesses. Thriving entrepreneurial spirit in a city will keep the city thriving as well. These angels provide a vital service for any city of any size. Many young people leave small towns to look for great job opportunities in a bigger city. I think that this loss of smart young talent is caused by our schools teaching young people to look for jobs. If our young people were taught to create businesses, many small towns could continue to thrive because they can hook into the rest of the world online. With the Internet, it's possible for even the most remote towns to bring the entrepreneur's spirit to life. Groups of private citizens operating as angel groups could do wonders to revitalize small towns everywhere. When you look at what Bill Gates did for Seattle, Washington, and what Michael Dell did for Austin, Texas, you can see the power of entrepreneurial spirit. Entrepreneurs and angels both play important roles in the vitality of a city. 3. Private Investors People who invest in private companies are called private investors. These accredited investors are hopefully more sophisticated than the average investor. They stand to gain, as well as lose, the most. Therefore, it is recommended to get both financial education and business experience before investing large sums of money into private companies. 4. Public Investors People who invest through publicly traded shares of public companies are called public investors. This is the mass market for securities. Because these investments are marketed to the masses, they generally come under great scrutiny from agencies such as the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. Securities traded here are generally less risky than investments done privately. Yet, when it comes to investing, there is always risk. This may seem to contradict what I said earlier about having more control, and therefore less risk, as an insider. Please remember, however, that a private investor is not always in control. The SEC requires strict compliance with reporting and disclosure requirements to reduce the risk to a public investor who is definitely not in control of the investment. Frank's Recommendations as I was interviewing Frank on the main points of taking a company public, I asked him what he would recommend for a person who wanted to learn to raise substantial sums of capital. He said, I recommend that a person become familiar with the following sources of funding if they want to take a company public. They are Private Placement Memorandums, PPMs. These should be the start of your formal capital raising activities. They are sort of a do-it-yourself way of raising money. A PPM is a way for you to dictate the terms you want, and hopefully the investor will be interested. Frank strongly recommends that you begin this process by hiring a corporate attorney who specializes in securities. This is where your formal education begins if you are serious about starting small and getting big. It begins with paying for advice from the attorney and then following that advice. If you do not like the advice, it is best to find a new attorney. Most attorneys will give you a free consultation or you can invite them to lunch. This type of professional advisor is vital to your team at the beginning and as you get bigger. I personally have learned the hard way by trying to do such things on my own to save a few dollars those few dollars saved have cost me fortunes in the long run. Venture Capitalists, VCs Venture capitalists, like my friend Mark, are in the business of providing capital. 
People usually go to VCs after they have exhausted personal funds, the money of family and friends, and their banker's money. Frank says, VCs often cut a tough deal, yet if they are good, they will earn their money. A VC will often become a partner and help you get your company into shape to move to the next level of financing. In other words, just as a person may go to a gym and hire a personal trainer to get his or her body into shape and become more attractive, a VC may act as a personal trainer who gets your business into financial shape so that it will be attractive to other investors. Investment Bankers You generally go to investment bankers when you are ready to sell your company to the public market. Investment bankers often raise money for IPOs and for secondary offerings. A secondary offering is a public offering of shares of a company that has already raised capital through an initial offering to the public. When you look in financial papers such as the Wall Street Journal, Many of the large ads are from investment bankers informing the market about offerings they have sponsored. There is another type of funding called mezzanine financing, sometimes referred to as bridge funding. A company usually looks for this kind of funding when it is past its early stages of development but not quite ready for an IPO. An Important First Step if you are ready to try your hand at raising capital for your business, you may want to start with a PPM. Frank recommends starting with a PPM for these reasons. You begin to interview and talk to corporate lawyers who specialize in this area. Interview several of them. Your education and knowledge will increase with each interview. Ask them about some of their failures as well as about their successes. You begin to learn about the different kinds of offerings you can make and how to structure them legally. In other words, not all offerings are equal. Different offerings are designed to fill different needs. You begin to place a value on your business and develop the terms you want when you sell the business. You begin formally talking to potential investors as well as practicing the art and science of raising capital. First, you may need to overcome your fear of asking. Second, you may need to get over your fear of criticism. Third, you get to learn how to handle rejection or phone calls that are not returned. Frank offers this advice. I have seen individuals give the best presentation on their investment, but fail to pick up the check at the end of the meal. The one thing an entrepreneur needs to do is learn how to pick up the check after lunch. If you cannot do that, then take along a partner who can. Frank also says the same thing my rich dad said. If you want to be in this business, you must know how to sell. Selling is the most important skill you can learn and continue to improve. Raising capital is selling a different product to a different audience. People are not successful financially mainly because they cannot sell. They cannot sell because they lack self-confidence, they are afraid of rejection, and they cannot ask for the order. If you are serious about becoming an entrepreneur and need more sales and confidence development, I strongly recommend that you find a network marketing company with a good training program, stick with it for at least five years, and learn to be a confident salesperson. A successful salesperson is not afraid of approaching people is not afraid of being criticized or rejected, and is not afraid of asking for the check. Even today, I continue to work on overcoming my fear of rejection, improving my ability to handle disappointment, and finding ways to improve my bouts of low self-esteem. I have noticed a direct correlation between my ability to handle those obstacles in my life and my wealth. In other words, if those obstacles appear overwhelming, my income goes down. If I overcome those obstacles, which is a constant process, my income goes up. How to find someone like Frank or Mark to advise you. After you have gained some fundamental business experience and have achieved a degree of success, and you think you are ready to bring your business to market, you will need specialized advice. The advice and guidance I received from Frank an investment banker, 
and Mark, a VC, have been priceless. That advice has created worlds of possibilities that did not exist for me before. When you are ready, get a copy of Standard & Poor's Security Dealers. This book lists security dealers by state. Get the book and find a person who would be willing to listen to your ideas and your business. Not all are willing to give free advice, but some are. Most are busy and do not have time for hand-holding if you are not ready. I therefore suggest getting some real-life business experience and having success under your belt before finding out who would be willing to be part of your team. So, are you the next billionaire? Only one person can answer this question. You. With the right team, the right leader, and a bold and innovative new product, anything is possible. Right after I knew that achieving my goal of making my first $1 million was possible, I began thinking about setting the next goal. I knew I could go on to make $10 million doing things much the same way. However, $1 billion would require new skills and a whole new way of thinking. That is why I set the goal despite continuing to come up against much personal self-doubt. Once I had the nerve to set the goal, I began to learn how others had made it. If I had not set the goal, I would not have thought it a remote possibility and I would not have come across books and articles about how so many people are achieving that goal. Several years ago, when I was deeply in debt, I thought becoming a millionaire was impossible. Therefore, in retrospect, I do not think actually achieving the goal is as important as writing down the goal and then going for it. Once I committed to the goal, my mind seemed to find the ways my goal could be possible. If I had said the goal of becoming a millionaire was impossible, I believe it would have become a self-fulfilling prophecy. After I set the goal to become a billionaire, I was plagued with self-doubt. However, my mind began to show me ways it was possible. As I focus on the goal, I continue to see how becoming a billionaire could be possible for me. I often repeat this saying to myself, If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. Either way, you're right. I don't know who the author is, but I thank that person for thinking it. Why is it possible to be a billionaire? Once I set my goal to become a billionaire, I began to find reasons you can become a billionaire today more easily than ever before. 1. The Internet is making a world of customers available to most of us. 2. The Internet is creating more business beyond the Internet. Just as Henry Ford created more business because his mass-produced cars had a ripple effect, the Internet will likewise magnify its effect. The Internet makes it possible for 6 billion of us to each become a Henry Ford or Bill Gates. 3. In the past, the rich and the powerful controlled the media. Now, with the Internet, each of us has the power to control our own media sites. 4. New inventions breed more new inventions. An explosion of new technology will make other areas of our lives better. Each new technological change will allow more people to develop more new and innovative products. 5. As more people become more prosperous, they will want to invest more and more money into new startup businesses, not only to help the new business, but also to share in the profits. Today, it is hard for most people to grasp the reality that there are literally tens of billions of dollars looking for new innovative companies to invest in every year. 6. It does not have to be high-tech to be a new product. Starbucks made a lot of people rich with just a cup of coffee, and McDonald's became the largest holder of real estate with just a hamburger and fries. 7. The key word is ephemeral. In my opinion, that word is one of the most important words for anyone who desires to become rich or super rich. Webster's defines the word as lasting only a day or lasting only a short time.
One of my teachers, Dr. R. Buckminster Fuller, often used the word ephemeralization. I understood him to use the word in the context of the ability to do so much more with so much less. A more common term is the word leverage, or the ability to do a lot with just a little. Dr. Fuller said that humans were able to provide more and more wealth for more and more people while using less and less resources. In other words, with all the new technological inventions, inventions that actually use very little raw material, each of us can now make a lot of money with very little time and effort. On the flip side of ephemeral, the people who use the most in raw materials and physically work the hardest in the process of earning their money will make less and less in the future. In other words, the financial future belongs to those who do the most with the least effort. So what is my plan to become a billionaire? The answer is found in the word ephemeral. To become a billionaire, I need to provide a lot for many, for very little. I need to find an area of business that today is fat, bloated, and inefficient, an area where people are dissatisfied with the current system and whose products need improving. The industry I have the most opportunity in is the biggest industry of all, education. If you take a moment and think about all the money that is spent on education and training, the dollar amount will stagger you. This goes beyond counting the money for public schools, colleges, and so on. When you look at the amount of education that goes on in business, the military, homes, and professional seminars, the dollar amount is the biggest of all. Yet education is the one industry that has remained the most mired in the past. Education as we know it is obsolete, expensive, and ready for change. Some years ago, a friend of mine, an international foreign exchange trader, sent me an article from the Economist website. The following are excerpts from that article. Michael Milken, the junk bond king who once earned $500 million in a single year, is now building one of the world's biggest education companies, Knowledge Universe. Kohlberg, Kravis, and Roberts, a buyout firm that strikes fear into managers the world over, also owns an education company called Kindercare. In Wall Street firms, analysts have taken to issuing breathless reports making such assertions as the education industry is undergoing a paradigm shift toward privatization and rationalization. Why is everyone suddenly so excited? Because of the parallels they see between education and health care. Twenty-five years ago, health care was mostly stuck in the public and voluntary sectors. Today, it is a multi-billion dollar, largely private industry. A lot of rich people, not just Mr. Milken and Henry Kravis, but also Warren Buffett, Paul Allen, John Doerr, and Sam Zell, are all betting that education is moving in the same direction. Companies from a range of conventional industries are investing in the business, including Sun, Microsoft, Oracle, Apple, Sony, Harcourt General, and the Washington Post Group. The U.S. government says that the country spends a total of $635 billion a year on education, more than it devotes to pensions or defense, and predicts that spending per pupil will rise by 40% over the next decade. Private companies currently have only 13% of the market, mostly in the area of training, and most of them are mom-and-pop companies, ripe for consolidation. International Data Corporation, a trends consultancy, reckons that this share will expand to 25% over the next two decades. The article continues by saying, America's public schools are increasingly frustrating parents and falling behind international standards. America spends more of its GDP on education than most countries, yet it gets mediocre results. Children in Asia and Europe often trounce their American counterparts in standardized scholastic tests. More than 40% of American 10-year-olds cannot pass a basic reading test, 
as many as 42 million adults are functionally illiterate. Part of the reason for this dismal performance is that close to half of the $6,500 spent on each child is eaten up by non-instructional services, mostly administration. Now the barriers between public and private sectors are eroding, allowing entrepreneurs into the state system. The 1,128 and growing charter schools are free to experiment with private management without losing public money. Not surprisingly, there is plenty of opposition to creeping privatization. The teachers' unions have an impressive record of crushing the challenges to their power. Don't go where you are not wanted. In 1996, my educational cash flow board game was submitted to a group of instructors at a prominent university for their feedback. Their verbal reply was, We do not play games in school, and we are not interested in teaching young people about money. They have more important subjects to learn. There is a rule of thumb in business. Don't go where you're not wanted. In other words, it is easier to make money where you and your products are wanted. The good news is that more and more schools have been using our games as teaching products in their classrooms. However, the best news is that the public likes our products. Our board games sell well to private individuals, as well as to community organizations, churches, and youth programs who want to improve financial education for themselves and their members. We knew we had come full circle when Thunderbird School of Global Management utilized Rich Dad Poor Dad Cash Flow Quadrant and the Cash Flow Games in its curriculum for their entrepreneurship program. This very prestigious university is internationally recognized for its educational programs. Back to the plan. I see a great need in the area of money management, business, and investing subjects that are not taught in school. The grim reality is that many people will not have enough money to retire on and get old. I suspect that there will be a growing outcry for more relevant financial education. The federal government has informed the American people that they should not count solely on Social Security or Medicare when they retire. Unfortunately, that word is too late for millions of people especially since the school system has never taught them how to manage their money. Kim and I intend to provide that education, both with our current products as well as over the Internet, for a much lower cost than the current school system could deliver it. Once we have those educational programs ready to deliver online, we will become a technology and Internet company rather than just a publishing company. Once we can deliver our products in that ephemeral way, the value and multipliers on the value of our company will go up because we will be able to deliver a better product to our international market more conveniently and for much less money. In other words, we will be able to do more and more with less and less, which is the key to becoming very, very rich. So will I ever become a billionaire? I don't know. I am continuing to go for the goal. How will I do it if I do it? I don't know that either. It has yet to be figured out. But I do know this. For years, I grumbled and complained that school never taught me anything about money, business, or becoming rich. I often wondered why they did not teach subjects I could use once I left school rather than teach subjects I knew I would never use. Then one day someone said to me, Quit your complaining and do something about it. And today, I am. I figure that if I am unhappy about not learning much about money, business, and becoming rich, other people probably have the same complaint. In closing, Kim and I do not want to compete with the school system. The current school system is designed to teach people to be employees or professionals. We can sell our ephemeral products to those who want what we offer, which is education for people who want to be entrepreneurs and own businesses or invest in business, rather than work in someone else's business. That is our target market, 
and we see the Internet as the perfect system to reach it without going through the antiquated school system. That is our plan. Only time will tell if we will reach our goal. If you want to be financially free, a multimillionaire, or maybe even the next billionaire, we want to be your financial education company. Chapter 41 Why do rich people go bankrupt? I often hear people say, When I make a lot of money, my money problems will be over. In reality, new money problems would just be beginning. One of the reasons so many newly rich people suddenly go broke is because they use their old money habits to handle new money problems. In 1977, I started my first big business, which was my nylon and Velcro surfer wallet business. The asset created was bigger than the people who created it. I lost the asset. A few years later, I created another asset that grew rapidly, and again, the asset got bigger than the people who created it. Again, I lost the asset. It took the third business for me to learn what my rich dad had been guiding me to learn. My poor dad was shocked at my financial ups and downs. He was a loving father, but it pained him to see me on top of the world one minute and in the gutter the next. But my rich dad was actually happy for me. He said, after my two big creations and disasters, most millionaires lose three companies before they win big. It took you only two companies. The average person has never lost a business. That is why 10% of the people control 90% of the money. After my stories about making millions and losing millions, I am often asked an important question. Why do rich people go bankrupt? I offer some of the following possibilities, all from personal experience. Reason number one. People who have grown up without money have no idea how to handle a lot of money. Too much money is often as big a problem as not enough money. If a person is not trained to handle large sums of money or does not have proper financial advisors, then chances are very strong that they will either stash the money away in the bank or just lose it. As my rich dad said, money does not make you rich. In fact, money has the power to make you both rich and poor. There are billions of people each day who prove that fact. Most have some money, but they spend it only to get poorer or greater in debt. The problem again stems from people receiving money and then buying liabilities they think are assets. I am certain that in the next few years, many of today's young millionaires will be in financial struggle because of their lack of money management skills. Reason number two. When people come into money, the emotional euphoria is like a drug that boosts your spirits. My rich dad said, When the money high hits, people feel more intelligent, when in fact they are becoming more stupid. They think they own the world and immediately go out and start spending money like King Tut with tombs of gold. My tax strategist once said to me, I have been an advisor to many rich men. Just before they go broke after making a ton of money, they tend to do three things. One, they buy a jet or big boat. Two, they go on a safari. And three, they divorce their wife and marry a much younger woman. When I see that happening, I begin preparing for the crash. Again, much like reason number one, they buy liabilities or divorce an asset, which then creates a liability. Then they marry a new liability. They now have two or more liabilities. Reason number three. The hardest thing for many people is to say no to people they love when they ask to borrow money. This has not happened to me, but I have seen many families and friendships break up when one person suddenly becomes rich. As Rich Dad said, a very important skill in becoming rich is to develop the ability to to say no to yourself and to the people you love. The people who come into money and begin buying boats and big houses are not able to say no to themselves, let alone their family members. They end up further in debt 
just because they suddenly had a lot of money. Not only do people want to borrow money from you when you have money, but banks want to lend you more money. That is why people say, banks lend you money when you don't need it. If things go bad, not only do you have trouble collecting the loans you made to friends and relatives, but the banks then have trouble collecting from you. Reason number four. The person with money suddenly becomes an investor with money, but without education and experience. Again, this goes back to Rich Dad's statement that when people suddenly have money, they think their financial IQ went up also, when in fact it has gone down. When a person has money, they suddenly begin receiving phone calls from stockbrokers, real estate brokers, and investment brokers. Rich Dad also had a joke about brokers. The reason they are called brokers is that they are broker than you. My apologies to any brokers who are offended, but I think my rich dad stockbroker is the one who told the joke to him originally. I had a friend of my family who came into a $350,000 inheritance. In less than six months, all that money was lost in the stock market, not to the market, but to the broker that churned the suddenly rich person who believed that money made him more intelligent. For those who do not know what churning means, it is when the broker advises the person to buy and sell regularly, so the broker makes the commission on each buy and sell. This practice is frowned upon, and severe fines are levied if brokerage houses find their brokers involved in this practice. Yet, it does happen. Just because you meet the qualifications of an accredited investor, simply a person with money, does not mean you know anything about investing. You will see many companies that invest as foolishly as individuals do. When there's a lot of money in the market, many companies run around buying other companies they hope are assets. In the industry, this is often called M&As, or mergers and acquisitions. The problem is that many of these new acquisitions can become liabilities. Often the big company that bought a small company ends up in financial trouble. Reason number five, the fear of losing increases. Many times a person with a poor person's outlook on money has lived a life being terrified of being poor. So when the sudden wealth hits, the fear of being poor does not diminish. In fact, it increases. As my friend who is a psychologist for professional day traders says, you get what you fear. That is why so many professional investors have psychologists as part of their team. At least, that is why I have one. I have fears, like everyone else. Reason number six. The person does not know the difference between good expenses and bad expenses. I often receive a phone call from my accountant or tax strategist saying, you have to buy another piece of real estate. In other words, I have the problem of making too much money and I need to invest more money in something like real estate because my retirement plan cannot take any more money. One of the reasons the rich get richer is that they buy more investments by taking advantages of the tax laws. In essence, the money that would have been paid in taxes is used to buy additional assets, which provide another deduction against income, which reduces the taxes due legally. The tetrahedron discussed earlier is to me one of the most important diagrams for wealth creation, as well as keeping and increasing the wealth created. When I show people the diagram, I am often asked why expenses are part of the structure. The reason is that it is through our expenses that we become richer or poorer, regardless of how much money we make. Rich Dad often said, if you want to know if a person is going to be richer or poorer in the future, just look at the expense column of their financial statement. Expenses were very important to Rich Dad. He often said, there are expenses that make you rich and expenses that make you poor. Smart business owners and investors know which kind of expenses they want and they control those expenses. Rich Dad said to me one day, the main reason I create assets is that I can increase my good expenses. The average person has mainly bad expenses. 
This difference in good expenses and bad expenses was one of Rich Dad's most important reasons for creating assets. He did so because the assets he created could buy other assets. As he said to me when I was just a kid walking along the beach looking at the very expensive piece of real estate he had just purchased, I can't afford to buy this land either, but my business can. If you understand the tax laws available to the B quadrant, you soon realize that one of the reasons the rich get richer is that the tax laws allow the B quadrant, more than other quadrants, to spend pre-tax dollars to build, create, or buy other assets. In fact, the tax laws almost require you to buy more investments with pre-tax dollars, which is why I received those phone calls telling me to buy more real estate or buy another company. The E quadrant, on the other hand, must often use after-tax dollars to build, create, or buy other assets. What to do with too much money? Rich Dad said, If you want to be rich, you must have a plan on how to make a lot of money. You must also have a plan in place for what to do with that money after you make it. If you do not have a plan in place for what to do with the money you make before you make it, you will often lose it faster than you made it. One of the reasons he had me study real estate investing was so that I would understand how to invest in real estate before I had a lot of money. Today, when my accountant calls and says, you have too much money, you need to buy more investments, I already know where to move my money, the corporate structures to use, and what to buy with that money. I call my broker and buy more real estate. If I buy paper assets, I often call my financial advisor and buy an insurance product, which then buys my stocks or bonds. In other words, the insurance industry produces special insurance products for rich people who are business owners. When a business buys insurance, it is an expense to the company, and it often becomes an asset to the owner with many tax advantages. In other words, when my accountant calls, much of the money is already spent according to a predetermined plan. It is spent as expenses that make the person richer and more secure. Over the years, I have seen many people start very profitable businesses and still end up broke. Why? Because they did not control their expenses. Instead of spending money to acquire other assets such as real estate or paper assets, they expensed it through frivolous business expenses or bought liabilities like bigger homes, nice boats, fast cars, and new friends. Instead of getting financially stronger, they became financially weaker with every dollar they made and then spent. The Other Side of the Coin Rich Dad often said, It is through the expense column that the rich person sees the other side of the coin. Most people only see expenses as bad, events that make you poor. When you can see that expenses can make you richer, the other side of the coin begins to appear to you. He also said, seeing through the expense column is like going through the looking glass as Alice did in Alice in Wonderland. Once Alice went through the looking glass, she saw this bizarre world that in many ways reflected the other side of the looking glass. Both sides of the coin really did not make much sense to me, but Rich Dad had said, If you want to be rich, you have to know the hopes, the fears, and the illusions on both sides of the coin. During one of my meetings with Rich Dad, he said something that changed my thinking from a poor person to a rich person. By having a plan to be rich and understanding the tax laws and corporate laws, I can use my expense column to get rich. The average person uses their expense column to become poor. That is one of the biggest and most important reasons that some people get rich and others become poor. If you want to become rich and stay rich, you must have control of your expenses. If you understand this statement, you will understand why Rich Dad wanted low income and high expenses. That was his way of getting rich. He said, Most people eventually lose their money and go broke because they continue to think like a poor person, and poor people want high income 
and low expenses. If you don't make this switch in your head, you will always live in fear of losing money and will try to be cheap and frugal rather than be financially intelligent and become richer and richer. Once you can understand why a rich person would want high expenses and low income, you will begin to see the other side of the coin. A very important point. The preceding paragraph is one of the most important paragraphs in this book. In fact, this book has been written around this one paragraph. If you do not understand it, I suggest that you sit down with a friend who has also read or listened to this book and begin a discussion to deepen your understanding of what it says. I do not expect you to necessarily agree with it. It would be good just to begin to understand it. You may begin to understand that there is a world of too much money, and you may understand how you can become a part of that world. Rich Dad said, People who do not change their point of view about money in their head will only see one side of the coin. They will see the side of the coin that only knows a world of not enough money. They may never see the other side of the coin, the side of a world of too much money, even if they do make a lot of money. By understanding that a world of too much money can exist, understanding a little of the tax laws and corporate laws, and why control of your expenses is so important, you can begin to see an entirely different world, a world very few people ever see. And seeing that world begins in your head. If your mental view can change, then you will begin to understand why Rich Dad always said, I use my expenses to get richer and richer. The average person uses their expenses to become poorer and poorer. If you understand that statement, you may understand why I think the teaching of financial literacy is important for our school system. It is also why my educational cash flow game can help you see a world of money that few people ever see. The financial statement is much like the looking glass in Alice in Wonderland. In the cash flow game, the player moves from the rat race of life onto the fast track of the investment world through mastery of the financial statement. How can low income and high expenses be good? So, as Rich Dad said, money is just an idea. And these last few paragraphs contain some very important ideas. If you understand fully why low income and high expenses are good, then move on. If not, please invest some time in discussing this point with someone who has also read or listened to this book. This idea is the pivotal point of this book. It also explains why many rich people go broke. So, please do your best to understand this point because it makes little sense to be creative, build an asset, and make a lot of money only to lose it all. When I studied the 90-10 rule, the one thing I discovered is that the 90% who earn the 10% are people who want high income and low expenses. That is why they stay where they are. A guideline. So the question is, how can low income and high expenses make you rich? The answer is found in how the sophisticated investor utilizes the tax laws and corporate laws to bring those expenses back to the income column. Again, the question is, how can low income and high expenses make you rich? If you can begin to understand how and why this is done, then you will begin to see a world of greater and greater financial abundance. In other words, the money comes in the income column and goes out the expense column and never comes back in. That is why so many people try to budget, save money, be frugal, and cut back on expenses. This also describes the person who will emphatically say, my house is an asset, even though the money goes out the expense column and does not return, at least not immediately. Or the person who says, I'm losing money each month, but the government gives me a tax break to lose money. They say that rather than say, I'm making money on my investment, and the government gives me a tax break to make money. My rich dad said, one of the most important controls you can have is found in this question. 
what percentage of the money going out your expense column winds up back in your income column in the same month. Rich Dad spent hours and days on this subject with me. By understanding his point of view, I saw a completely different world that most people do not see. I could see a world of ever-increasing wealth, unlike people who work hard, earn a lot of money, and keep their expenses down. So, ask yourself the same question. What percentage of the money going out your expense column comes back in your income column in the same month? If you can understand how this is done, you should be able to see and create a world of ever-increasing wealth. If you are having difficulty understanding this idea, find someone else and discuss how it might be done. If you can begin to understand it, you will begin to understand what a sophisticated investor is doing. It's worth the discussion and is why you may want to read or listen to and discuss this book often. It really was written to change a person's point of view from the world of not enough money to the view of creating a world of too much money. What is the value of a network marketing business? When I speak to network marketing companies, I often say to them, you don't know the value of your network marketing business. I say that because many network marketing businesses only focus on how much money such a business can generate. I often warn them that it's not how much money they make, but how much money they can invest with pre-tax dollars that is important. That is what the E-Quadrant cannot do. To me, that advantage is one of the biggest advantages of a network marketing business. If used properly, a network marketing business can make you far richer than merely the residual income the business generates. I have several friends who have made tens of millions of dollars in network marketing and are still broke today. When I speak to the industry, I often remind the leaders of network marketing that a vital part of their job is not only to educate people on how to make a lot of money, but to educate them on how to keep the money they make. It is through their expenses that they will ultimately become rich or poor. Why are more businesses better than one? It is not only network marketing people who fail to realize the true value of their business. I have seen entrepreneurs who are good at building a business yet do not realize the true value of that business. The reason this happens is that many people believe that you only build a business to sell it. That is the idea of a business owner who does not know what a sophisticated investor knows about the tax laws and corporate laws. Instead of building a business to buy assets, they often just build the business, sell it, pay the taxes, put the cash in the bank, and start all over again. I have had several friends who have built businesses just to sell them. Two friends of mine have sold their companies for cash and then lost all that cash in their next business venture. They lost because the 90-10 rule for business survival is still in effect. These two were individuals from the S-quadrant who built B-quadrant businesses. They then sold those businesses to people from the B-quadrant. The buyers recognized the often unseen value of a B-quadrant business so the friends who sold their businesses ultimately went broke, even though they had collected several million dollars. The businesses they sold went on to make the new owners even richer. A sophisticated business owner and investor will do their best to keep the business as long as possible and have it acquire as many stable assets as possible. As my rich dad said, the main reason I build a business is for the assets the business buys me. For many entrepreneurs, the business they build is their only asset because they utilize a single corporation strategy and fail to harness the power of a multi-corporation investment strategy. Again, to utilize such a strategy requires a team of professional advisors. This points out that the big advantage the B-Quadrant has is that their tax laws allow you to spend pre-tax dollars to make you financially richer. In fact, the laws reward you for investing as much money as possible. After all, it is the rich who write the rules. The Power of Expenses 
Expenses can be an asset or a liability, regardless of how much money you make. One of the reasons 90% of the people only have 10% of the money is that they do not know how to spend the money they make. As Rich Dad said, a rich person can take trash and turn it to cash. The rest of the people take cash and turn it to trash. So, what is the answer to the question, why do rich people go bankrupt? It is the same reason poor people remain poor and the middle class struggles financially. The reason the rich, the poor, and the middle class go broke is because they lose control of their expenses. Instead of using their expenses to make them rich, they use their expenses to make them poor. Phase 5. Giving it back. Chapter 42. Are you prepared to give back? Investor control number 10. Control over giving it back. Dan, a high school classmate of mine, was passing through town and asked if we could play golf. Dan was always a great golfer, and I had not played in months, so I hesitated at first. Realizing that the purpose of the game was to spend time together to renew an old friendship rather than compete in a round of golf, I agreed to play. While riding around on the golf cart being humiliated by Dan's golf game, the conversation turned to what we were doing at this stage of our lives. When I told Dan that I had retired and was building businesses, one to take public and one to be held privately, he became very angry. His anger caused him to accuse me of being greedy, thinking only of myself and exploiting the poor. After about an hour of trying to keep my cool, I could take no more. Finally, I asked, What makes you think that the rich are greedy? His reply was, Because all I see are poor people all day long. I never see rich people doing anything for them. Dan is a legal aid attorney for people who cannot afford an attorney. The gap between the haves and have-nots is bigger than ever, and it is not improving. We now have families who have no hope of ever getting out of poverty. They have lost sight of the dream that America was founded on, and guys like you make more and more money. Is that all you can think about? Build businesses and get rich? You've become just as bad as Mike's dad, a greedy rich man who only got richer. Dan's temper began to calm down as the game continued. Finally, at the end of the game, we agreed to meet the next day at the hotel's restaurant and I would show him something I was working on. The next day, I showed Dan the game. What is the game board for? asked Dan after we were seated at the table. Showing him the game, I explained my theory that poverty is caused by lack of education. It is a learned condition, I said, it is taught at home. Since school doesn't teach you about money, you learn about it at home. So what does this game teach? Dan asked. It teaches the vocabulary of financial literacy, I said. Words are, in my opinion, the most powerful tools or assets we as humans have, because words affect our brain, and our brains create our reality in the world. The problem many people have is that they leave home and school and never learn or understand the vocabulary associated with money, which results in a lifetime of financial struggle. Dan studied the colorful game board while the waitress brought us more coffee. So you plan to end poverty with a board game? He asked sarcastically. No, I chuckled. I'm not that naive or optimistic. I created this game primarily for people who want to become business owners and investors. Cash flow management is a basic skill necessary for anyone who wants to be rich. So you created this game for people who want to be rich, not for the poor, Dan asked, his anger rising again. Again, I chuckled at his emotional reaction. No, 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 I said. I did not create this product to exclude the poor. I'll say it again. I created this game for people who want to be rich, regardless of whether you are rich or poor today. The look on Dan's face softened, if only a little. My products 
are designed for people who want to be rich, I repeated again. My products cannot help anyone, regardless of what their financial station in life is, unless they first want to be rich. My products will not help a rich person or a middle-class person unless they, too, want to become richer. Dan sat there, shaking his head. His anger was getting higher. Finally, he said, You mean I've spent all my life trying to help people, and you're saying I can't help them? No, I am not saying that, I replied. I cannot comment on what you do or how effective you are. Besides, that is not for me to judge. So what are you saying, Dan asked. I'm saying you can't help people unless they truly want to help themselves, I said. If a person is not interested in becoming rich, my products are worthless. Dan sat there, quietly absorbing the distinction I was attempting to make. In my world of law and legal aid, I often give advice to people. Many people don't take it, said Dan. I see them again after a year or two, and their situation is the same. They're back in jail, or they're brought up again on charges for domestic violence or whatever. Is that what you're getting at? Advice alone does no good unless the people truly want to change the situations in their lives. That is what I am saying, I said. That is why the best diet and exercise plan will not work unless the person really and truly wants to lose weight, or why it is often a waste of time and a disturbance to the rest of the class to have a student in the room who is not interested in learning a subject. It is tough to teach anyone who is not interested in learning, and that includes me. For example, I have no interest in learning to wrestle sharks, so you cannot force me to learn. But my golf game is different. I will study hard, practice for hours, and pay big money for lessons because I want to learn. Dan sat there, nodding his head. I understand, he said but I did not show you this game for the aspect of getting rich, I said. I want to show you what Rich Dad taught Mike and me about being generous, about giving money back. For the next ten minutes, I explained Phase 5 of Rich Dad's plan, pointing out to Dan that it was a big part of Rich Dad's plan to be generous, to be charitable. I said to Dan as I pointed to the game board, Mike's dad taught us five distinct phases of wealth and money. Phase five is the responsibility of giving money back after you make it. Mike's dad strongly believed that to make money and hoard it was a misuse of the power of money. So you put phase five of Mike's dad's plan on your game board? Dan asked a little suspiciously. Your game board not only teaches people to be rich, but it also teaches people to be generous? I nodded my head. It was part of the plan, a very important part. Having grown up with Mike and me, Dan knew who Rich Dad was. He had heard about the investment plan Rich Dad and I had drawn up after I returned from Vietnam. Dan was aware of what I had gone through to learn to be a business owner and an investor. When I spoke of phases three and four, where I was investing in other business and getting richer, he had lost his temper. He was now learning about Phase 5. As I said, Phase 5 is probably the most important phase of Rich Dad's plan. I purposely built it into this game, I said. So what is Phase 5? asked Dan. Show it to me on the game board. I then pointed to the squares on the fast track of the board game. The board game consists of two different tracks. One circular track on the inside is known as the rat race. The outer rectangular track is known as the fast track, which is where the rich invest. These pink squares are phase five, I said, pointing to one of the squares. A kid's library, Dan read out loud as he read the square where my finger was pointing. I then pointed to another square. A research center for cancer, Dan read aloud. And so is this square, I said, moving my finger and pointing to another square. A gift of faith, Dan said, reading the line just below where my finger was pointing. You mean you built charitable squares into the fast track, 
the investment track of the very rich? asked Dan. Nodding my head, I said, yes, there are two kinds of dreams on the fast track, dreams for personal indulgence and dreams for creating a better world with your excess wealth. Dan shook his head slowly, saying, You mean Mike's dad taught you and Mike to be charitable as well as rich? I nodded my head as I quickly pointed to all of the different charitable dreams found on the fast track of the game board. Rich Dad said one of the most important controls an investor had was the control over returning most of the money back to society. He had a reputation as a rich, greedy man, said Dan. Many people said terrible things about him, about how greedy he was. That is what most people thought, I replied. Yet Mike and I knew differently. The more money he made, the more money he gave away. But he gave it away quietly. I did not know that, said Dan. So his later years were dedicated to giving all the money he amassed back to society? Well, not all of it, I said. He wanted to leave some for his children. The point I want to make is that many people have this belief that the rich are greedy. That belief blinds them to the truth or the reality that not all the rich are greedy. If you open your eyes, you will see that many of the very rich have made tremendous financial contributions to society. Look at what Andrew Carnegie has given back through libraries, Henry Ford through his Ford Foundation, and the Rockefellers through the Rockefeller Foundation. John D. Rockefeller not only created his charitable foundation to give away his money, but he also donated extensively to the University of Chicago, as many rich alumni donate to their schools. Many other ultra-rich people have founded their own institutions of higher learning, just as Stanford founded Stanford University and Duke founded Duke University. The rich have always been very generous to higher education. Vanderbilt University was founded by a very rich entrepreneur, added Dan. I realize that the rich create jobs and provide goods and services to make life a little better. So now you're telling me that they often give the money back to society. That is exactly what I am saying, I replied. And yet many people can only see what they think is the greedy side of the rich. I know that there are greedy rich people, but there are also greedy poor people. So your rich dad gave it back, Dan repeated. Yes, I replied. Phase five made him the happiest of all the phases. Besides, being charitable increased his expenses, reduced his income, and took him through the looking glass. What? stammered Dan in confusion. What looking glass? Never mind, I said. Just know that being generous made him happy in more ways than one. What did he give to? asked Dan. Since his own father died of cancer, Rich Dad's foundation gave tremendous amounts of money to cancer research. He also built a cancer ward in a small country hospital so the country people could be closer to their loved ones when they were hospitalized. Being a very religious man, he also built a classroom building for his church so the church could have a larger Sunday school for kids. And he was a patron of the arts, acquiring artwork from many talented artists as well as donating money to the museums. The best thing, is that his foundation is so well directed that even after his death, it will continue to earn and donate money. Even in death, he will still do a lot of good for society. The trusts and foundations he set up will be providing money for many worthy causes for years to come. He planned to have too much money in life, and he planned on having too much money in death, said Dan. He definitely had a plan. I replied. So your cash flow game really does include everything your rich dad taught you. He taught you how to make the money and how to give the money back, said Dan. I did my best to include in the game all of the important things rich dad taught me about money. And the importance of giving back was one of the things he taught me, I replied. He taught me to control the acquisition of wealth, and he taught me how to control giving it back. I wish more people did that, said Dan. Oh, there will be more people giving more money back, I said. Just look at this baby boom generation. 
Many were hippies in the 60s, and they are fast becoming multimillionaires today. In a few years, the revolution they were a part of will be in full force with cash flow. Many of these one-time hippies and others of that generation are very socially responsible people. What they learned from the 60s, their poor college days, will be brought to fruition in the next few years. Their ideals, coupled with their wealth, will be a powerful financial, political, and social force in the world. I think that they will do the charitable deeds that our government cannot afford to do today. Many rich boomers will be completing socially responsible deeds they wanted to perform when they were poor. What makes you think they will be generous? asked Dan. Because it is already happening, I replied. Bill Gates alone has pledged billions of dollars to various causes and has a full-time staff to give the money away. If you look around, you'll see that this baby boom generation of wealthy entrepreneurs will be pressuring each other to be generous. It will be very socially uncool to be rich and not be generous. So Mike's dad was a generous man, and he taught you and Mike to be generous. I nodded my head. Even though many people in town criticized him for being rich, he continued to give quietly. Being generous made financial sense to him, as well as giving him pleasure. I really did not know that, Dan said quietly, and giving money away made him happy. I nodded my head. In the later years of his life, I saw a peace come over him that I had never seen before. He had done a lot of good during his life, and he would continue to do good when his life was over. His life was complete. He was very proud of both Mike and me. He said he knew I was more like my real dad. He knew I was a teacher, and he hoped I would go on to teach others as he had taught me. He wanted me to be both dads, a rich man as well as a teacher. And was that it? asked Dan. No, I replied, he couldn't leave it at that. He was always afraid that I would give up along the way. He was afraid that I would not have the persistence to make my investment plan come true, which would mean my financial dreams would not come true. He was always afraid that I would join the quitters of the world, doing what was easy rather than doing what was necessary. The last advice he gave me was, Keep going. Keep minding your own business. Keep being true to your dreams, and all your dreams will come true, I said quietly. Bringing me back to the present, Dan asked, So, have all your dreams come true? Almost, I replied. I still want to become an ultimate investor. When Kim and I started the Rich Dad Company, our mission was to elevate the financial well-being of humanity. That's a pretty aggressive mission, Dan said with his eyebrows raised. I can see how you would say that, but we accomplish our mission every day. We receive calls, letters, and emails every day from people who have taken action to improve their financial lives. We have been overwhelmed by the response we have from the people using our products. Every time we hear from someone who has improved their financial well-being, we have accomplished our mission. That sounds great, Robert. It's nice to see you so energized by giving, Dan said. We are still developing our outreach and programs. The important thing is to support learning wherever we can. Kim and I have been very blessed with success, and we want to continue to look for ways to give back by helping others learn and then teach financial literacy. Conclusion Why it no longer takes money to make money While teaching an investment class, I was asked, what internet company would you recommend I invest in? I replied, Why invest in someone else's internet company? Why don't you start your own internet company and ask people to invest in it? There are many investment books written on how to buy assets. This book has been dedicated to learning how to create assets that buy assets. So why not take the time to consider creating an asset rather than simply buying an asset? It has never been easier to create your own asset. The world is 10 years old. On October 11, 1998, 
Merrill Lynch ran a full-page ad in several of the larger American newspapers announcing that the world was just 10 years old. Why just 10 years old? Because it had been approximately 10 years since the Berlin Wall had come down. Tearing down the Berlin Wall is the event some economic historians use to mark the end of the Industrial Age and the beginning of the Information Age. Until the Information Age, most people had to be investors from the outside. Now, more and more people can invest from the inside rather than from the outside. When I answered, why invest in someone else's internet company, why not start your own company, I meant, it is now the information age, so why not become an insider instead of an outsider? Three Ages In the agrarian age, the rich were those who owned a castle that overlooked large tracts of fertile agricultural land. Those people were known as the monarchs and the nobles. If you were not born into this group, you were an outsider with very little chance of becoming an insider. The 90-10 rule controlled life. The 10% who were in power were there because of marriage, birth, or conquest. The other 90% were serfs or peasants who worked the land but owned nothing. During the agrarian age, if you were a good, hard-working person, you were respected. The idea of being diligent was handed down from parent to child. Because 90% of the people worked to support the rich 10% who appeared not to be working, the idle rich began to be loathed. That idea was also handed down from parent to child. These ideas continue to be popular and are still handed down from generation to generation. Then came the Industrial Age, and wealth shifted from agricultural land to real estate. Improvements such as buildings, factories, warehouses, mines, and residential homes for the workers were placed on top of the land. Suddenly, rich, fertile agricultural land dropped in value because the wealth shifted to the owners of the buildings upon the land. In fact, an interesting thing happened. Suddenly, rich, fertile land became less valuable than rocky land where farming was difficult. Rocky land suddenly became more valuable because it was cheaper than fertile land. It could also hold taller buildings such as skyscrapers or factories, and it often contained resources such as the oil, iron, and copper that fueled the industrial age. When the shift in ages occurred, many farmers' net worth went down. To maintain their standard of living, they had to work harder and farm more land than before. It was during the Industrial Age that the go-to-school-so-you-can-find-a-good-job idea became popular. In the Agrarian Age, a formal education was not necessary since professions were handed down from parent to child. Bakers taught their children to be bakers, and so on. Near the end of the Agrarian Age, the idea of a job, or the idea of one job for life, became popularized. You went to school, got that one job for life, worked your way up the corporate ladder or up the union ladder, and when you retired, the company and the government took care of your needs. In the industrial age, those not of noble birth could become rich and powerful. Rags to riches stories spurred on the ambitious. Entrepreneurs started with nothing and became billionaires. When Henry Ford decided to mass-produce the automobile, he found some cheap, rocky land that farmers did not want near a small town known as Detroit, and an industry was born. The Ford family and anyone around them who did business with them became, in essence, the new rich nobility. New names became as prestigious as those of kings and queens, names such as Rockefeller, Stanford, and Carnegie. People often respected, as well as despised them, for their great wealth and power. However, in the Industrial Age, as during the Agrarian Age, only a few controlled most of the wealth. The 90-10 rule still held true, although this time the 10% was not determined by birth, but by ambition and determination.
the 90-10 rule held true simply because it took great effort and coordination as well as a lot of money, people, land, and power to build and control the wealth. For example, to start an automobile company or an oil or mining company is capital intensive. It takes massive amounts of money, lots of land, and many smart, formally educated people to build that type of company. On top of that, you often must get through years of bureaucratic red tape, such as environmental studies, trade agreements, labor laws, and so on, to get such a business off the ground. In the industrial age, the standard of living went up for most people, but the control of real wealth continued to remain in the hands of a few. These rules, however, have changed. The 90-10 rule has changed. When the Berlin Wall came down and the World Wide Web went up, many of the rules changed. One of the most important rules that changed was the 90-10 rule. Although it's likely that only 10% of the population will always control 90% of the money, the access or the opportunity to join that 10% has changed. The World Wide Web has changed what it costs to join the 10%. Today, it does not take being born into a royal family as it did in the agrarian age. It does not require massive sums of money, land, and people as it did in the industrial age. The price of admission today is an idea, and ideas are free. In the information age, all it takes is information or ideas to become very, very wealthy. It is therefore possible for individuals who are financially obscure one year to be on the list of the richest people in the world the next. Such people often fly past individuals who made their money in the ages gone by. College students who have never had a job become billionaires. High school students will surpass their college student counterparts. In the early 1990s, I remember reading a newspaper article that said many Russian citizens complained that under communist rule, their creativity was stifled. Now that communist rule is over, many Russian citizens are finding out that they had no creativity. Personally, I think all of us have a brilliant creative idea that is unique to us, an idea that could be turned into an asset. The problem for the Russians, as it is with many citizens all over the world, is that they did not have the advantage of my rich dad's guidance in teaching them to understand the power of the B.I. triangle. I think it is very important that we teach more individuals to be entrepreneurs and how to take their unique ideas and turn them into businesses that create wealth. If we do so, Our prosperity will only increase as the information age expands around the world. For the very first time in world history, the 90-10 rule to wealth may no longer apply. No longer does it take money to make money. No longer does it take vast tracts of land or resources to become rich. No longer does it take friends in high places to become rich. No longer does it matter what family you were born into, what university you went to, or what sex, race, or religion you are. Nowadays, all it takes is an idea, and as Rich Dad has always said, money is an idea. For some people, however, the hardest thing to change is an old idea. There is truth to the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I think a more accurate saying is, You can't teach someone who clings to old ideas new tricks, regardless of whether they are young or old. So when I am asked, what internet company would you invest in, I still reply, why not invest in your own internet company? I am not necessarily suggesting that they start an internet company. All I am doing is asking them to consider the idea, the possibility of starting their own company. In fact, Many franchise and network marketing opportunities are now available on the Internet. When people simply consider the idea of starting their own B-quadrant business, their minds shift from hard work and physical limits to the possibility of unlimited wealth. All it takes is the idea. 
I am not suggesting that such people quit their job and leap into starting a company, but I do suggest that they keep their full-time job and consider starting a business part-time. The Challenge of Old Ideas In news coverage of the stock market, you often hear announcers say, old economy versus new economy. In many ways, the people being left behind are people who continue to think in old economy ideas versus new economy ideas. Rich Dad constantly reminded his son and me that money is just an idea. He also warned us to be ever vigilant, to watch our ideas and challenge them when they needed to be challenged. Being young and lacking experience at the time, I never fully realized what he meant. Today, older and wiser, I have tremendous respect for his warning to challenge our old ideas. As Rich Dad said, what is right for you today could be wrong for you tomorrow. I have watched Amazon.com, a company starting out without any profits or any real estate, grow faster and become more valuable in the stock market than established retailers such as Sears and J.C. Penney. A new, not yet profitable online retailer is perceived as more valuable than industrial age retailers with solid profits, years of experience, massive real estate holdings, and more assets than any monarch of old. But the new online retailer is considered more valuable just because it does not require massive amounts of real estate, money, and people in order to do business. The very things that made industrial age retailers valuable in the industrial age are making them less valuable in the information age. You often hear people say, the rules have changed. I often wonder what the future holds for these older retailers and their investors as more and more internet companies slice into profit margins, selling the same products for lower prices. What will that mean in the future to investor loyalty and to job security, pay raises, and benefits for employees? And what will happen to the value of real estate? Only time will tell. Many of the new Internet companies have failed, and investors have lost millions, if not billions, of dollars. They failed because, ultimately, profits and positive cash flow are how a business survives. But many industrial-age companies are also failing because of price competition from these online retailers with no real estate. I recently heard an old-school retailer say, We will make shopping an entertaining experience. The problem with such thinking is that making shopping an entertaining experience is expensive. Many shoppers will come to enjoy the experience but will still buy online for a better price. I have a dear friend who has been my travel agent for years. However, she now has to charge me a service fee for my airline tickets because the airlines have stopped paying her a commission on ticket sales. She has had to release several of her loyal staff and now worries that I will shift to buy my tickets for a lower price online. At the same time, Online travel companies have sprouted up with various strategies like auctioning off perishable products known as empty airline seats. While the online travel companies become wealthy, my dear friend lays off staff and counts on her loyal customers to stay with her because she will work harder and provide better service. I am sure she will do okay, but the business she started years ago as her retirement safety net has now become a full-time job with no assurance that it will be of any value whatsoever when she's ready to retire. Things have changed. Since it does not take money to make money, then why not go out and make a lot of money? Why not find investors to invest in your idea so you can all become rich? The answer is that often, old ideas get in the way. Because the online world is relatively young, the good news is that it is not too late to change your thinking and begin to catch up if you have not already started. The bad news is that sometimes the hardest thing to change are old ideas. Some of the old ideas that may need to be challenged are the ones that have been handed down for generations. Be a good, hard-working person. 
the reality today is that the people who physically work the hardest are paid the least and taxed the most. I am not saying not to work hard. All I am saying is that we need to constantly challenge our older thoughts and maybe rethink new ones. Consider working hard in a part-time business for yourself. Today, instead of being in just one quadrant, we need to be very familiar with all four quadrants of the cash flow quadrant. After all, we're in the information age, and working hard at one job for life is an old idea. The idle rich are lazy. The reality is that the less you are involved physically in your work, the greater your chances are of becoming very rich. Again, I am not saying to not work hard. I am suggesting that today we all need to learn to make money mentally, not just physically. Those who make the most money work the least physically. They work the least because they work for passive income and portfolio income rather than ordinary earned income. And as you know by now, all a true investor does is turn ordinary earned income into passive and portfolio income. In my mind, today's idle rich are therefore not lazy. It is just that their money is working harder than they are. If you want to join the 90-10 crowd, you must learn to make money mentally more than physically. Go to school and get a job. In the industrial age, people retired at age 65 because they were often too worn out to lift tires and put engines into a car on the assembly line. Today, you are technically obsolete and ready for retirement every 18 months, which is how fast information and technology are doubling. Many people say a student today is technically obsolete immediately upon graduation from school. Now more than ever, my rich dad's statement is even more relevant. School smarts are important, but so are street smarts. We are a self-learning society, not a society that learns from its parents, as in the agrarian age, or from its schools, as in the industrial age. Kids are teaching their parents how to use computers, and companies are looking for high-tech kids more than for middle-aged executives with college degrees. To stay ahead of the obsolescence curve, continual learning from school as well as the street is vitally important. When I speak to young people, I advise them to think like professional athletes as well as college professors. Professional athletes know their careers will be over as soon as younger athletes can beat them. College professors know that they will become more valuable the older they get if they continue to study. Both points of view are important today. Rich Dad's advice is even more true today. For those of you who have read or listened to my first two books, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Cash Flow Quadrant, you know the difficulty I went through listening to two different dads and their ideas about money, business, and investing. In 1955, my poor dad kept saying, go to school, get good grades, and find a safe and secure job. On the other hand, my rich dad kept saying, mind your own business. My poor dad did not think investing was important. He would say, the business and the government are responsible for your retirement and medical needs. A retirement plan is part of your benefit package, and you are entitled to it. My rich dad would say, mind your own business. My poor dad believed in being a good, hard-working man. He would say, find a job and work your way up the ladder. Remember that companies do not like people who move around a lot. Companies reward people for seniority and loyalty. My rich dad said, mind your own business. My rich dad believed that you must constantly challenge your ideas. My poor dad believed strongly that his education was valuable and most important. He believed in the idea of right answers and wrong answers. My rich dad believed that the world is changing and we need to continually keep learning. Rich Dad did not believe in right answers or wrong answers. He believed instead in old answers and new answers. He would say, You cannot help but get older physically, but that does not mean you have to get older mentally. 
if you want to stay younger longer, just adopt younger ideas. People get old or obsolete because they cling to right answers that are old answers. Here are some examples of right answers that are old answers today. Can humans fly? The correct answer prior to 1900 was no. Today, it is obvious that humans are flying everywhere, even in space. Is the Earth flat? The correct answer in 1492 was yes. After Columbus sailed to the New World, the old right answer was obsolete. Is land the basis of all wealth? The answer before the Industrial Age was yes. Today, the answer is a resounding no. It takes an idea and knowledge from the B and I quadrants to make that idea real. Once you prove you know what to do, the world is full of rich investors looking to give their money to you. Doesn't it take money to make money? I am most frequently asked this question. The answer is no. In my opinion, it has always been no. My answer has always been it does not take money to make money. It takes information to make as well as to keep money. The difference is that it has become much more obvious today that it does not take money or hard labor to make a lot of money. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. No one does. That is why Rich Dad's idea of constantly challenging and updating ideas was one of the most important ideas he passed on to me. Today, I see so many of my friends falling behind professionally as well as financially simply because they fail to challenge their own ideas. Their ideas are often very old answers handed down for generations, from one economic era to another. Some high school kids plan on never having jobs. Their plan is to bypass the whole industrial age idea of job security and become financially free billionaires instead. This is why I ask people to think about building their own internet business, either on their own or through a franchise or network marketing company, instead of just looking for one to invest in. Today's thinking process is very different. And it may challenge some very old right ideas. Those old ideas often make the process of change difficult. Ideas just need to be better. Always remember that once you have mastered the guidelines found in the BI triangle, you can virtually take nothing and turn it into an asset. When I am asked what my first successful investment was, I simply reply, my comic book business. In other words, I took comic books that were going to be thrown away and created an asset around them using the principles found in the BI triangle. Starbucks did the same thing with a cup of coffee. So ideas do not have to be new and unique, they just have to be better. This has been going on for centuries. In other words, things do not have to be high tech to be better. In fact, many things that we take for granted today. We're very high tech yesterday. There are many individuals who spend their lives copying other people's ideas rather than creating their own. I have two acquaintances that make it a practice of taking other people's ideas. Although they may make a lot of money, there is a price for taking other people's ideas without their permission or giving credit where credit is due for those ideas. The price these people pay, although they may make a lot of money, Is the respect of the people that know they take other people's ideas without permission. As my rich dad often said, there is a fine line between copying and stealing. If you are creative, you have to be careful of thieves who steal ideas. They are just as bad as people who burglarize your home. Because there are more people stealing than creating, it becomes ever more important to have an intellectual property attorney on your team. Protecting your creations. One of the most important technological changes in the history of the Western world took place during the Crusades when Christian soldiers came across the Hindu Arabic system of numbers. The Hindu Arabic system of numbers, so named because the Arabs found this numbering system during their invasion of India, replaced Roman numerals. 
few people appreciate the difference this new system of numbers has made upon our lives. The Hindu-Arabic system of numbers allowed people to sail further out to sea with greater accuracy. Architecture could be more ambitious, timekeeping could be more accurate, and the human mind could be sharpened, allowing people to think more accurately, abstractly, and critically. It was a major technological change that had a tremendous effect on all of our lives. The Hindu-Arabic numbering system was not a new idea. It was simply a better idea. And on top of that, it was someone else's idea. Many of the most financially successful people are not necessarily people who have creative ideas. Many of them often just copy other people's ideas and turn the idea into millions or even billions of dollars. Fashion designers watch young kids to see what new fashions they are wearing, and then they simply mass-produce those fashions. Bill Gates did not invent the operating system that made him the richest man in the world. He simply bought the system from the computer programmers who did invent it and then licensed their product to IBM. The rest is history. Amazon.com simply took Sam Walton's idea for Walmart and put it on the Internet. Jeff Bezos became rich much more quickly than Sam Walton. In other words, who says you need to have creative ideas to be rich? You just need to be better at the B.I. triangle and at taking ideas and turning them into riches. Following in your parents' footsteps Tom Peters, author of In Search of Excellence, has been saying over and over again, job security is dead. Yet many people continue saying to their children, go to school so you can find a secure job. Many people struggle financially simply because they have their parents' ideas about money. Instead of creating assets that buy assets, most of our parents worked for money and then bought liabilities with that money innocently thinking they were assets. That is why many people go to school and get good jobs, because that is what their parents did or advised them to do. Many struggle financially or live paycheck to paycheck because that is what their parents did. When I teach my investment classes, a very important exercise is for students to compare what they are doing today to what their parents did or advised them to do. Many times, students realize that they are either following closely in their parents' footsteps or are following their parents' advice. At that point, they have the power to question these old ideas that have been running their lives. If a person truly wants to change, adopting a better idea is often a good idea. My rich dad always said, if you want to get richer faster, simply look for ideas that that are better than the ones you are using today. That is why, to this day, I read biographies of rich entrepreneurs and listen to recordings of their lives and their ideas. As Rich Dad said, ideas need not be new. They just need to be better. And a rich person is always looking for better ideas. Poor people often defend their old ideas or criticize new ones. Only the paranoid survive. Andy Grove, former chairman of Intel, titled his book Only the Paranoid Survive. He got that title from Dr. Joseph A. Schumpeter, a former Austrian minister of finance and Harvard Business School professor. Dr. Schumpeter expressed this idea that only the paranoid survive in his book Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. Dr. Schumpeter was the father of the modern study of dynamics, the growth and change in economics. Lord Keynes was the father of that study of statics, or static economics. Dr. Schumpeter's idea is that capitalism is creative destruction, a perpetual cycle of destroying the old, less efficient product or service and replacing it with new, more efficient ones. Dr. Schumpeter believed that governments that allow the existence of capitalism, which tears down weaker and less efficient businesses, will survive and thrive. Governments that put up walls to protect the less efficient will fall behind. My rich dad agreed with Dr. Schumpeter, which is why he was a capitalist. 
Rich Dad challenged Mike and me to constantly challenge our ideas because if we didn't, someone else would. Today, people with old ideas are those who are falling behind the fastest. The world we face today reminds me of the song, The Times They Are A-Changin'. A line from that song goes, For you'd better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. Although that song was written many years ago, it reflects our future more and more. In other words, just because you're rich or poor today does not mean you will be in the near future. Your past success means nothing. Those who do not risk failing will ultimately fail. My poor dad looked upon failure as a thing, and my rich dad looked upon failure as an action. That difference made a big difference over a lifetime. In Future Edge, Joel Barker wrote, When a paradigm shifts, everyone goes back to zero. Your past success means nothing. In this fast-changing world, paradigms will be changing faster and faster, and your past successes could mean nothing. In other words, just because you work for a good company today does not ensure that it will be a good company tomorrow. For this reason, Grove chose to title his book Only the Paranoid Survive. Even employee benefits are changing. The information age changed the rules of retirement plans from defined benefit pension plans to defined contribution pension plans. The change has also affected some employee benefits. A friend who works for an airline said, It used to be easy to get free flights on airlines, which is one of the benefits of being an airline employee. But today, with airlines auctioning off empty seats online, the planes are flying full, and I find it harder to use a benefit I love. The rules have changed. As this audiobook draws to a close, I will leave you with some ideas about the changes that we all face today, changes that were brought on once the Berlin Wall went down and the World Wide Web went up. In his book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, Thomas L. Friedman describes several changes between the Industrial Age and the Information Age. Some of the changes are 1. Industrial Age, Einstein's E equals MC squared. Information Age, Moore's Law. During the Cold War, Einstein's theory of relativity, E equals MC squared, ruled. In 1945, when the United States dropped the atomic bomb on Japan, America became the economic power of the world and took military dominance away from England. During the 1980s, everyone thought Japan was about to beat the United States economically, and the Nikkei stock market surged. But Japan's period of economic dominance was short-lived because the United States redefined itself. The United States redefined itself because it shifted from E equals MC squared to Moore's Law. Moore's Law states that the power of technology will double every 24 months. America became the leading world power because it led in technology as well as weaponry. If America had remained in the weapons race only, we would have soon become a bankrupt nation like the former Soviet Union. When the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, America's capital markets shifted quickly into the information age. That freedom to change quickly is the financial power provided by a free capitalistic society. Japan, as well as England, cannot change that quickly because both countries have too many ties to the days of the feudal system, otherwise known as the monarchy, an agrarian age institution. Unconsciously, those countries are waiting for the monarch to lead them. In other words, innovation is often hampered by traditions. That idea is true for individuals as well as nations. As Rich Dad said, old ideas get in the way of new ideas. I am not suggesting that we get rid of old traditions. Rather, because we are now in the information age, we need expanded ideas. 2. Industrial age, weight of missiles. Information age, speed of modems. When the Berlin Wall came down, 
E equals mc squared changed to Moore's law. The power in the world shifted from the weight of nuclear warheads to how fast your modem is. The good news is that a fast modem costs a lot less than big missiles. Speed matters more than weight. 3. Industrial age. Two world powers in charge. Information age. No one in charge. During the Cold War, there were two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Today, the Internet makes the idea of a borderless world and a global economy a reality. Today, the electronic herd, which is the thousands of fund managers who control great sums of money, has the power to affect world politics more than politicians do. If the electronic herd does not like the way a country is managing their financial affairs, they will move their money elsewhere at the speed of light. It is not the politicians who have the power today, as they did in the industrial age. In the information age, it is the power of global digital money that often dictates a country's affairs. When Bill Gates crossed the border from the United States to Canada some years ago, the customs agent asked him if he had anything of value to declare. He pulled out a stack of floppy disks wrapped in rubber bands. This is worth at least $50 billion, he said. The customs agent shrugged, thinking he was talking to a nut and let the richest man in the world pass through the border without paying anything in taxes. The point is that the bundle of floppy disks wrapped in rubber bands really was worth at least $50 billion. That bundle of floppy disks was the prototype of Microsoft's Windows 95. Super-rich individuals like Gates often have more money and more influence over the world than many large nations. Such power caused the U.S. government to take Gates to court for monopolistic practices. When that case started, a friend of mine said, The frightening thing is that Gates can afford to hire better attorneys than the U.S. government can. That is because the U.S. government is an industrial-age institution, and Gates is an information age individual. Following in this line of thinking, George Soros believes that many corporations have much more money and power than many Western nations. That means there are corporations today that could damage the economy of an entire nation just to benefit a few shareholders. That is how much power many corporations have. In the years ahead, many changes, both good and bad, will occur. I believe that capitalism will be unleashed to its fullest extent. Old and obsolete businesses will be wiped out. Competition, as well as the need to be cooperative, will increase. Younger companies will buy out older ones. These changes are all happening because the genie known as technology has been released from the bottle, and information and technology are now cheap enough for everyone to afford. The Good News The good news is that for the very first time, the 90-10 rule of the rich no longer needs to apply. It is now possible for more and more people to gain access to the great world of infinite wealth, the wealth found in information. And information is infinite, not restricted as land and resources were in ages gone by. The bad news is that the people who cling to old ideas may be brutalized by the changes upon us as well as by the changes yet to come. If Rich Dad were alive today, he might say, the Internet is much like the California gold rush of the 1850s. The only difference is that you do not need to leave your home to participate in it, so why not participate in it? He would probably go on to say, during any economic bonanza, there are only three kinds of people. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who say, what happened? Although I started with Einstein's theory of relativity as an obsolete idea from the Cold War, I also think of Einstein as a true visionary. Even then, he recognized an idea that is even truer today. Imagination is more important than knowledge. The really good news is that, for the first time in history, 
the Internet gives more and more people the ability to see the other side of the coin if they go there with open eyes. Taking my ideas and creating an asset with those ideas was one of the best challenges I have undertaken. Although not always successful, my skills increased with each new venture, and I could see a world of possibilities that few people see. So the good news is that the Internet makes it easier for more people to access a world of abundance that for centuries has been available to just a few. The Internet makes it possible for more people to take their ideas, create assets that buy other assets, and have their financial dreams come true. We've only just begun. Karen and Richard Carpenter sang a song entitled We've Only Just Begun. For those of you who think you may be too old to start over again, always remember that Colonel Sanders started all over again at age 66. The advantage we have over the colonel is that we are all now in the information age, where it only matters how young we are mentally, not how old we are physically. Your Most Important Investment You are making an important investment by listening to this audiobook regardless of whether you agree with it or not. In today's ever-changing world, the most important investment you can make is an investment in ongoing education and searching for new ideas. So keep searching and keep challenging your old ideas. One of the main points of this audiobook is that you have the power to create a world of not enough money as well as a world of an abundance of money.